Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. How is everybody? <laughs> Absolutely glad to see everybody here tonight. For those who are joining us on Facebook Live, we're glad that you are streaming and joining us and uh, hope and pray that you're doing well. We have some announcements we want to share with everybody, so y'all uh, lend me your ear for a moment. Uh, there are Christmas card boxes out in the foyer. They are in alphabetical order. Uh, so all you got to know is your last name and where that falls in the alphabet and then find it in one of those three boxes. So, um, and if you want to participate, all you got to do is just uh, uh, make out some Christmas cards uh, for those in the church and uh, you can bring them up here. And uh, if you want us to, we can uh, put those in the right spot for you uh, or you can do it yourself. But those are out there uh, on the table as you go out on the right uh, there in the foyer. Also, Food for Friends is tomorrow. Uh, if you're able to help us, please be here at the building around 10 o'clock tomorrow morning, and uh, we'll do a good work uh, together. But that is Food for Friends uh, tomorrow morning about uh, 10 o'clock. All right, as you probably already know, uh, now that we're in December, we're going back to our regular scheduled services, all of those services, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, children's Bible hour, jam, all those uh, classes are up and running, uh, and I know our kids are tickled pink. They are excited, so we're we're excited as well. Those in need of our prayers, uh, Brother Gary Hall uh, went to the hospital Sunday, has a UTI, but I believe he's doing some better. How's he doing today? Doing better? All right. Okay. All right. Back to the urologist. Uh, Gracie Gafford, as we've uh, mentioned before, uh, has been diagnosed with the coronavirus. Her symptoms are uh, relatively mild. Uh, their whole family has been quarantined, I believe, except for Scott. I don't think uh, uh, he, he was having to uh, uh, quarantine, but uh, uh, beyond uh, going stir-crazy at home, I think everybody is doing, doing as well as they can. I uh, found out today that uh, Tina Hayes, uh, you remember Tina and Lester Hayes, uh, she is in the hospital in Dothan. I don't know uh, anything further yet on her, but remember Tina Hayes in your prayers. Uh, also, I saw on Facebook that Shandora Moore, uh, remember Shandora, she had all five of her toes on her right foot amputated. Uh, so please uh, do remember her in your prayers. That, I believe that surgery was today. I think she uh, um, suffers a lot with uh, diabetes. So please uh, remember her in your prayers. Uh, also, um, Bob Doyon's going to have a heart calf on Friday, so we want to remember him uh, in our prayers. Uh, also, we want to remember all of our shut-ins, uh, those who are sick. There's a lot of uh, viruses, not COVID-19 related in any way, but a lot of other sicknesses going around, uh, people battling cancer, uh, grieving the loss of loved ones. And if, if you have any announcements uh, that you only want uh, our elders, maybe your minister, uh, to read and to know about and to pray for. Uh, you want to keep them private. Uh, you can write those down. Uh, give it to one of our elders or to myself, and uh, uh, we will certainly be praying for that. So just throwing that out there. If you have anything private that you don't want announced or shared on Facebook, but you do want uh, our elders or myself uh, to be aware of it and to be praying for you, we will certainly do that. Just let us know. Again, we're glad everybody is here. Uh, we're going to begin with the word of prayer in just a moment. M yes, My mom, Samantha. Sherry. And you said she's where? Let's remember 
Samantha's mom, Sherry Dean, in our prayers. Keep us informed on how, how she's doing each day, if you don't mind. Uh, but uh, whatever announcements you do want announced, if you will, just write it down. Uh, share it with us. You can give them to uh, Shanna or myself. We'll make sure they're on our announcement sheet or if you want it on Facebook or if you uh, want it in the bulletin or however you want it uh, out there, please just let us know. Uh, in just a moment, Jay's going to lead us in a couple songs. Uh, and then I'm going to ask uh, Brother Andy, Andy Wiggins, if you don't mind at the end, if you'll dismiss us in prayer. Would you bow with me right now as we pray? Father God, we love you. We thank you for this opportunity tonight to be together. Father, we thank you for each and every one that's uh, assembled here tonight, uh, whether in person or uh, being with us on Facebook Live as we stream. Father, we thank you for uh, the time that we have together. And Father, we pray tonight that as we study from your word that you will uh, bless us with an open mind and an open heart, a willingness to receive and, and to make application of uh, the lesson that's going to be shared tonight. We thank you for all of our teachers, uh, for all of our students who are here ready to learn and eager to grow in their knowledge. Uh, Father, we pray that you'll help us uh, to be more like you each day. Uh, Father, there are many that we have <coughs> mentioned here tonight who are uh, sick and hurting. Uh, dear God, they have faced surgeries or procedures and they are uh, recovering. We thank you for their progress and uh, pray your continued blessings of healing and strength to be with them. Uh, Father, for those uh, who have lost loved ones and are facing procedures and uh, looking forward to and anticipating uh, different things to, to be done for them to help them get better. Uh, Father, we pray for comfort and peace and that uh, your will be done in each of our lives. And Father, we pray tonight for this great nation that we live in. Uh, Father, we pray that you bless our leaders. Uh, we pray that you will uh, help us to be uh, more like you and that they will look to you for wisdom and guidance and strength as they make decisions in how they lead us, the laws that are passed, and how we're governed. Uh, Father, we pray for our military, uh, both locally and abroad, wherever they may be found, their families that they leave behind. We pray that you keep them safe and protect them, and that you'll bring them home very soon. Uh, Father, most of all tonight, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for his love, for the sacrifice that he made. And Father, we pray that you'll help us to walk more uh, each day in the footsteps of Jesus. For it's through him that we pray. Amen. Jay? This is the day, this is the day that the Lord hath made, that the Lord hath made. I will rejoice, I will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord hath made. I will rejoice and be glad in it.
I was thinking of a, a few scriptures that uh, I think relate well to that. Again, the statement is the strength, uh, the secret of strength is the presence of Christ in our life. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Or one we all know very well, I'm sure, Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You know, we all have storms. We all have problems to deal with. And I got to thinking, is it really fair that we wait until we cannot handle or solve or even fix our problems before we call on God to help us out? You see, we must rely on God every step of life's journey. Not just in the good times, not just in the bad times, but at all times. Mountaintop, down in the valley, whatever the situation may be. Jesus said in John 15 and verse 5, without me you can do nothing. Without me you can do nothing. So I think a better perspective uh, in life would be to stop telling God how big your problems are. And instead start telling your problems how big your God is. You see, life's not about waiting for the storms to pass. It's about how we make it through the storms that matters the most. And we can do that when we remember Peter's words, I believe in 1 Peter 5 and verse 7, where Peter tells us to cast all your care, your anxiety on him, for he cares for you. You see, life, is, life has a way of, of draining us, of, of zapping us of our strength. Making us weak, making us tired, like we can't go another step. But then I remember one of my favorite scriptures, because it has to do with eagles. I love eagles. Everybody knows that by now. Isaiah 40 and verse 31. But those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. So what a blessing it is to have this time. On a Wednesday night, to come together from out of the world, to come together to study the Word of God, to draw strength from God, to draw strength and encouragement from God's Word and even our fellowship uh, together. So I would encourage you to look around the room. These are not only fellow Christians, brothers and sisters in Christ, but they are uh, powerhouses, if you will, or sources of strength. And we all need to recharge our spiritual batteries, don't we? We get down, we get low, and we need to be uh, recharged. So Wednesday night is just that kind of a situation, an opportunity for us. Um, between Sundays, between the Lord's days, uh, to, uh, to plug in and to recharge uh, our spiritual batteries. So remember, again, the secret of strength is the presence of Christ in our lives. So I want to encourage you simply tonight to fill up on Jesus. To fill up on Jesus as we go into... Uh, our Bible class times uh, together. But tonight, if you're here and we can be a source of encouragement or strength to you, maybe you need to repent of sin, obey the gospel, uh, maybe tonight, whatever it is you need to do, uh, you'll take the advantage and the opportunity to do that. Uh, we're going to sing a song to encourage. Uh, if we can help in any way, please come and let us know how as we stand together and sing. When the Savior calls, I will
right, good to see everybody sticking around. I need a helper or two. I don't know, we got 25 or so of those. Maybe that'll be enough. <coughs> if not, it's a good problem to have. We can make copies. <coughs> Again, we're glad to see everybody here tonight. Uh, if you're streaming live on Facebook and you want, want one of these outlines that are coming out, all you have to do is raise your hand and we'll make sure someone brings it to you. But you'll have to hold that hand up high because we don't know where you're at. I know for sure there is one one gentleman that wants to be here so bad he can't hardly stand it, and that's Brother Gary. Brother Gary wants to be here so bad it's just, it is just hard to keep, keep him down and keep him away. But he, uh, he did give me all the material and the stuff he had that he was going to use to put together a lesson. And uh, so this is what we've got tonight. I want to share this uh, lesson with you on behalf of Brother Gary. I'm, I'm hoping, I'm a praying uh, that he will be able to be back uh, hopefully next week. Uh, gets his strength back, uh, a good, good measure of it to where he can, uh, he can be here uh, and uh, be able to, to teach class. But I told him, don't worry about it. You take care of yourself. And uh, we, we will um, make our way through these lessons. And uh, I, know, I know the class here would much rather have him than me. Uh, Y'all have had enough of me for a while, I'm sure, uh, but until he gets back, uh, we'll just carry on. But our lesson tonight is entitled, Against All Odds, Against All Odds, uh, The Church Across the Ages. And I'm going to uh, ask you to, to really, really participate tonight. Um, don't have a, an overwhelming amount of scriptures, but we do have uh, several that we want to look at, and I'm going to ask you if you want to read. You certainly don't have to vo volunteer to read out loud, but if you are one who... Uh, uh, can read, uh, and you don't mind reading out loud, uh, that would be wonderful uh, if you don't mind uh, helping me out. Uh, if you do have your Bible, go ahead and turn to uh, the very first scripture that's given here. Uh, there's three right across the top. Matthew 13, uh, verses 44 to 46, and then Acts chapter 2, uh, 42 to 47, and then someone get the last one, Acts chapter 4, uh, verse 32 to verse number uh, 33. I believe as we get to these scriptures, um, the first one there in Matthew chapter 13 talks about uh, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, uh, being like a treasure, being like a pearl. And that's going to uh, really <coughs> emphasize, I believe, the, the worth and the, and the value uh, of the kingdom of God. And as we move into Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 4, uh, those scriptures there are going to help us understand about the, about the growth and the life uh, of the Lord's church. Are y'all hearing an echo? Maybe it's just me. I don't know. I don't think the... Is the volume up too high on, on this? We good? Okay. All right. Maybe it's just me. Who, who's got uh, uh, Matthew chapter 13, uh, verses 44 to 46, and wants to read? Matthew 13, 44 to 46. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which a man found and hid. And for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who when he has found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. All right. Hidden treasure, the worth, uh, the value, the importance uh, of the kingdom of God. Who's, who's ready to read in Acts chapter 2, the next passage, beginning in verse 42? And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. <coughs> now all who believed were together and had all things in common. And sold uh, their possessions and goods and divided it among all as anyone had need. So continuing, 
continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people and all the Lord ate, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. I think uh, two things for sure that come out of the scriptures that Brother Charles just read there in Acts 2 are about the, about the everyday life uh, of, of the first century church, about the growth and what they were busy doing and committing themselves to. We'll see this again in the next passage here, Acts chapter 4. Um, whoever's there, Acts chapter 4 beginning in verse 32 down to about verse 36. Again, the, the growth, uh, the life of the church, the, the generosity uh, of the Lord's church as they came together to, to help everyone uh, that had a need. And so as we begin tonight, we need to realize that, that the church has never really had it easy uh, when, when it comes to growth. If any new venture ever seemed to be striking out against all odds, I believe it would have been the early church here. Uh, beginning on that fateful day of Pentecost in A.D. 30. You see, they not only would survive, but I believe we can see through Scripture that they would, they would thrive, they would flourish, and they, they would grow uh, almost exponentially rather quickly, uh, even in uh, the most difficult odds and opposition. You see, just 50 days earlier, uh, their founder, their leader, the Lord Jesus Christ, had been executed as a common criminal uh, on the cross. And so now they were to go, and they, they, were to, they were to tell an unbelieving world that the Christ, the anointed Messiah of God, uh, that they had seen crucified was now resurrected from the dead, and that he demanded their complete allegiance. They had a difficult task at hand. And if there was ever a difficult time for the church to grow, I do be believe that it was in the first century. In spite of the odds that were stacked against them, these brethren, the, the church grew. The church grew. Even in the face of extreme opposition, extreme persecution, uh, the church grew. You'll never read anywhere in the book of Acts, anywhere, any of our brethren saying something like, we can't do that. You won't find it. It's just not there. They didn't have that kind of attitude, a, de, a defeated uh, kind of attitude. But instead, we'll read verses like Acts chapter 5, verse 29, where it says, We must obey God rather than men. They had a very optimistic, victorious, overcome, conquer. We can do this because God is with us. God is on our side attitude. So these first century brethren, they never offered or made any kind of excuses. But I want us to consider uh, in this lesson uh, some, some of the obstacles. And we're, your, your outline you have ought to just go right down uh, the list here as far as an outline. And the first point is, what, what were some of the obstacles uh, in the way of the early church? Now, this by no means is an exhaustive list, but uh, let me just give you a couple of them along the way. Now, as far as the world was concerned, uh, the church was promoting a crucified criminal uh, as Lord. Being Lord and Master, they were promoting a crucified criminal in the eyes of the world. Another obstacle might be that Christians were considered to be antisocial because they would not join in with the ways uh, of the world. 
Uh, another obstacle could be uh, that they were being accused of being atheists because they did not uh, believe in any other god but the one true god of heaven and earth. They even rejected uh, the Roman gods, little g, gods, uh, and the state religion of emperor worship. They didn't want to have anything to do with idolatry or paganism. They had one true God, the God of heaven and earth. So they were being labeled as being atheists. Another, another obstacle to their growth might be that they were accused of being cannibals. Accused of being cannibals because they would partake of the flesh and blood of Christ in the Lord's Supper. Or so it seemed. But we know that they were using unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine. But they were being falsely accused of being, being cannibals in the misunderstanding of what they were doing. Maybe another obstacle would be uh, how, how baptism offended uh, many of the Jews because it would replace circumcision. Again, misunderstanding of, of the purpose and the meaning. Maybe some more obstacles we could think of. Maybe even the church being demand, that demanded morality. You know, as the church, they would demand morality in an immoral world. So there's going to be friction. When you got one, one set of people who are living one way and another set of people living in direct opposition, if you remember in the Karate Kid movie, uh, Mr. Miyagi. I always like to think about Mr. Miyagi when uh, uh, young Daniel got hurt in that uh, final match. Something happened with his leg. Mr. Miyagi lays him out on that table. You, you remember the scene, don't you? You've seen it a hundred times like I have. He comes in there and <laughs> claps some hands together. and He starts to, if you do it right, ooh, you can feel some friction. You can smell some flesh burning here. He gets warm. Friction. When you've got two opposing forces going in two different directions, there's going to be friction. There's going to be rub. And that's what happens when the church demands, when God demands in Scripture uh, that we live a moral, God-like life in a very godless, immoral world. There's going to be that friction. Paul would even tell us in Romans 12, verse 2, Do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So definitely an obstacle would be uh, the way that these early Christians lived. A godly, moral life according to the standard of Scripture in a very immoral world. Maybe another obstacle would be that Christians would not participate in pagan activities. They didn't want to participate in, in the activities uh, of uh, the world that would pull them uh, away from God. Uh, the church was even accused of uh, breaking up families, uh, bre breaking up husbands and wives, or uh, mothers and fathers and even children from their parents when they would decide to become a Christian and obey the gospel, uh, many times that would mean that they would be uh, basically uh, breaking up their family, being expelled from the family because of their newfound religion, uh, their, their new uh, walk with God. And so those family ties were, were being severed, and that would be an obstacle. Well, maybe another obstacle would be the, the simple fact that the, the church suffered some severe physical persecution. I mean, you read through uh, just, just in the book of Acts, you, you can read where uh, persecution was severe. Beatings, put them in prison, uh, stoning them, uh, all sorts of physical torture and abuse. Uh, they could have used that as an obstacle or an excuse uh, not to be the church or not to be uh, Christians. Maybe another obstacle would be how that the church was seen as a cult, a new movement, something, something completely different and foreign to uh, what anyone had seen or heard before. Maybe an obstacle would be that the church met in secret. They had to meet behind closed doors, maybe very, very early in the morning or really late at night, but they had to meet in secret many times. Christians were despised. They, they were despised because many of them uh, were slaves. They were very, very poor. So that, that despise or rejection 
uh, that uh, uh, mistreatment simply because of their economic status or the lack thereof uh, could have served as an obstacle. Another obstacle may be since these early Christians would not swear by Caesar, uh, these Christians were considered to be disloyal citizens, disloyal citizens uh, within society. But no matter which way the church went or, or what they did, they faced trouble. They faced opposition, uh, which many times would result in uh, some form of persecution, social rejection, uh, sometimes even political danger. So there's a lot of obstacles. Maybe you can think of uh, many others that ought to be on uh, that list. But I believe all of this opposition could have caused these Christians, the first century church, to just really, you know, just throw up their hands, throw in the towel, we quit. But they didn't. No doubt there probably were some of them who did, just walked away. But we read that the church grew. The church grew by leaps and bounds in that first century. So the real question tonight is that we want to look at and answer uh, is how. How did the church grow against all odds? Well, first on your list there, letter A, little a, is Christian living on the part of every member. The, the church grew because every member committed themselves to, to living the Christian life. Brother Charles. Absolutely. They were looked on as being honest, good folks. And that's not just people within the church. That's all people out in the community, everywhere. They, they were highly, highly thought of in spite of all the persecution uh, they faced. And that's very, very true. The church grew here, this, this first point that we want to get to. Uh, Christian living, living the Christian life uh, with every member. You see, that, that unimpeachable conduct... Uh, it's clearly evidenced uh, in the lives of these Christians. It would serve as a light. It would illuminate the way uh, for many people in this Roman world uh, that was darkened by sin uh, and depravity. I think this is what Jesus really was getting at uh, in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Somebody read, if you will, Philippians chapter 2, verse 15. See how quick some fingers can get. Maybe you've got an electronic version of the Bible. Punch it in. Philippians chapter 2, verse 15. Philippians chapter 2, verse 15. Who's got it? Who's the quickest among us? I kind of had it. Blameless and heartless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. There you go. Children of God without fault in the midst of, Paul says, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom, among whom you shine as lights in the world. You know, light shines its brightest in the darkest dark. And that's the case with the early church. I want to share a quote with you. It was in all the material that Brother Gary uh, gave to me. It's a quote by uh, Justin Martyr. Justin Martyr was an early Christian apologist. He was a philosopher of the day. Uh, he lived from about uh, 100 A.D. to 165 A.D. But this is what he wrote to uh, Emperor Antonius Pius about believers of the day. Very, very uh, profound here. He said, We formerly rejoiced in uncleanness of life, but now love only chastity. Before, we used magic arts, but now dedicate ourselves to the true and unbegotten God. Before, we love money and possessions more than anything, but now we share what we have and to everyone who is in need. Before, we hated one another and killed one another and would not eat with those of another race. But now, since the manifestations of Christ, we have come to common life, and pray for our enemies and try to win over those who hate us without just cause. In another place, Justin points out how those opposed to Christianity were sometimes won over as they saw the consistency in the lives of believers noting their extraordinary forbearance when they were cheated and their honest in business dealings. 
Brother Charles was, was making uh, the point earlier. They had a high reputation. They were favored even in the community. People saw how they lived their lives, their, their Christ-like lives. Honesty, integrity, faithfulness, uh, those things would, would shine bright. They would notice that difference, and it would make a huge difference in how the church would grow. They would want to be a part of that. So Christian living certainly uh, on the part of every member helped uh, the church grow, not only then, but even today. The second point we want to make is that uh, uh, Christians were known as those who cared for hurting people and they prayed for those who were uh, in need. Uh, their generosity, their willingness to help and to serve and to take care of one another. You see, Christians started the first Meals on Wheels program. I don't know if you ever thought of it that way, but they did. It seems to me that by A.D. 250, they were feeding about uh, 1,500 people every day in Rome. Imagine that. Imagine preparing some 1,500 meals every day for other people. Sometimes we think 60 boxes or 22 plates on a Saturday is a lot, and maybe it is. But 1,500 or more, it's amazing. When, when Emperor Julian the Apostate wanted to revive the pagan religion in the mid-300s, he gave this insight into the spread of the church. I want to uh, re read this as well because this, this re really speaks highly uh, of, of the church. He said that uh, Christians, Christianity... Uh, has been specially advanced through the loving service rendered to strangers and through their care of the burial of the dead. It is a scandal that the Christians care not only for their own poor, but also for ours as well. While those who belong to us look in vain for the help we should be rendering to them. Galatians 6 and verse 9, Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore... As we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers, to the household of God. So the way these Christians uh, cared for uh, those who were hurting or suffering and struggling, we even read about that earlier as we started. Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 4. They were taking care of each other. They would sell property and houses and their possessions, and they, and they would give to help meet the needs of uh, of other people. That's what we see from the early church. The care, the concern, the love, the, the sacrificing and the sharing uh, of their material possessions to help each other and all people who may have a need. That contributed to the growth of the church. The third one there on your list, letter C. Something that helped the early church grow was strong Bible preaching and teaching. Strong Bible preaching and teaching certainly uh, took place on that first day of Pentecost. You read in Acts chapter 2, uh, as P Peter gave that first gospel sermon, uh, very clearly, uh, boldly preached Jesus Christ and the gospel. You see, when God's word uh, is uh, proclaimed plainly, clearly, forcefully sometimes, uh, uncompromisingly, uh, but with love, with kindness, uh, it will edify and it will build up. That's one, one of the blessings and the power of God's Word. It will build us up. Need some more readers if y'all are ready. We've got a couple of scriptures here to share. Um, somebody get ready for Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15. If y'all write these down, uh, you can find them. Help me read. Ephesians 4, 15. Uh, Acts chapter 4, verse 29. Acts chapter 20, verse 32. 2 Timothy 3:16 and 17 and then 2 Timothy 4 verses 2 through 4. I'm going to help out on some of these cuz there's quite a few of them there. Anybody already at Ephesians chapter 4 verse 15? I appreciate your help. Ephesians 4:15. Right. Speaking the truth in love. We have to have a love as we speak the truth and because sometimes the truth uh, of God's word uh, does hurt. But when it is spoken and shared, communicated in love, it does bring about growth. All right, Acts chapter 4, verse 29. 
Acts 4, 29. Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word. All right, with all boldness they may speak your word. Facing opposition, facing jail, fa facing persecution, uh, the church came together there to, to pray for uh, boldness. Here's, here's the next verse. Acts chapter 20, verse uh, number 32 says, says this. So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. The word of God. Uh, is able to build us up, to strengthen us, uh, to edify our faith. By the way, where does faith come from? Romans ten seventeen. faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So we, if we want to build up and strengthen our faith, we've got to feed it uh, the word of God. All right, uh, who's ready with 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17? 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. There is benefit with the Word of God. It, it profits us in so many different ways. That's why we have the Word of God. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning in verse 2, Paul told young Timothy, Preach the Word, be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long-suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, healthy doctrine. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears... They will heap up for themselves teachers. And they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. That's one, one of the reasons why we have to uh, have strong Bible preaching and teaching is because of the, the myths, the fables, the false teaching uh, and those things that are going around that just are contrary to the Word of God. So the difference, the difference between what the world taught, what the world believed... And what these Christians, what the Word of God teaches, uh, was very clear. Not only how it was preached and what was being preached, but how it was being lived uh, in their lives. But the fourth point we want to get to on, on how did this early church grow? The church we read of in the New Testament, what did they do? Well, they had good leadership. They had good leadership. We don't have time tonight to go into the uh, qualifications of uh, uh, the leaders, the elders. But they're given in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and in Titus chapter 1. And when you take time to read those qualifications uh, that were required uh, for elders and even for deacons within the Lord's church, you see they are personal, they are relational, and they are focused on leadership skills uh, within uh, the home, within the family, within their own individual lives. Uh, and that would carry over into uh, the church. You see, these would be men who would make themselves uh, examples to the flock. Examples to the flock, God's people. These would be men who would carefully uh, tend to and uh, take charge uh, of the Lord's church. Uh, turn over to 1 Peter, if you will. 1 Peter chapter 5. I will read here a scripture to you. 1 Peter chapter 5. Uh, as, as Peter writes about uh, these types of men, the shepherds. 1 Peter chapter 5, in verse uh, number 1, Peter says, The elders who are among you I exhort, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. He says to them, Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. These, these would be uh, leaders, examples uh, to the Lord's flock. And so to grow, to grow, the church must have quality leadership. Those who are uh, willing to serve men who know how to lead uh, and they are willing to do so in uh, the capacity of the Lord's church we'll move ahead to the to to the next one 
There's a lot we could say about all of these tonight. But the next one, I believe it's number five, letter E, is congregational warmth and love. And again, all, all of these serve as ways to help the Lord's church to grow. Not only then, that we read of in Scripture, in the early church, but especially today. Uh, congregational warmth uh, and love. You see, the, the fellowship of the Lord's church should be, should be sweet. It should be precious so that the, the whole community, uh, every, every, everyone around us sees how we interact and uh, they'll take notice and they'll observe. They'll say things like, um, you see how much they love each other? They help each other when they're down. They need food. They need money. They need clothes. They need a uh, car. They need whatever. See how they help each other. And that's what Jesus was speaking of. John chapter 13, verse 35, when he said, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. The world will take notice. The community will see that love in our life. That's what we see in those verses we started out with in Acts chapter 2, uh, verse 44 and verse 45, or in Acts 4, uh, verses 32 to 35, how they, because of love, they, they cared enough to share, uh, to sell, and to sacrifice to help meet the needs uh, of other people. And that's what Paul was saying. We referenced it just a moment ago, Galatians chapter 6, verse 10. As we have, therefore, opportunity, let us do good, especially to those who are the household of faith. But we do that for everyone, congregational warmth uh, and love. And I think we do a tremendous job of this here uh, at the Op Church of Christ. Uh, people in the community uh, all the time uh, are, are uh, commenting. I hear it. I'm sure you guys hear it as well. How, how loving and friendly, how uh, warm and accepting uh, we are. Uh, how, how good we are to, to do a lot of different things to help uh, people. People want to be a part of something like that. They want to know, how can I get in on that? You know, people need um, food. They know where to come to. They know who to call. How long have we been doing Food for Friends, Meals on Wheels? Food for Friends program been going for, what, over 40 years? A long time? People call the church building. In fact, I'll just tell you this as we get uh, close to the end had a lady call just the other day. She had called every church, every organization she knew to call. You know what she needed? Two folding tables. She called the Chamber of Commerce here in town, and whoever answered the phone said, have you tried the Church of Christ here in Op? For two folding tables. She was having a yard sale at her house, and she needed two folding, folding tables. But that's the reputation the Lord's Church has here, right here in Op. If we can help you, we certainly, certainly will. I didn't give her two fold, folding tables. I didn't know what to do. I never had anybody call about two folding tables. But they need a call. They need food, they call. And they get food. If we can help them, we most certainly uh, will. Let's move ahead to uh, uh, the, these last two as we close. Uh, the last one here, letter F, is uh, evangelistic fervor. Evangelistic fervor. You see, the emphasis, we can, we can note this time and time again all through Scripture. Uh, the early church was focused on soul winning, preaching the gospel, teaching the word of God. And that contributes to, obviously, the, the numerical growth. You read in Scripture how, how the Lord was adding to the church daily. Those were being saved, Acts 2 uh, and, and verse 4. Uh, 47 we read about this growth they weren't just growing scripture says they were multiplying they were multiplying rapidly we don't have time to read all of these but I would encourage you to write these down these scriptures write down Acts chapter 5 verse 42 Acts 5 and verse 42 and then write down Acts chapter 6 verse 1 and then verse 7 you see, when we follow the, the example of these early Christians, the early church, they were very evangelistic. When a problem, problem would arise, uh, like, like in uh, Acts chapter 6, cer certain ones were being neglected and overlooked, what did they do? They, they came together and they figured out what to do. They put a plan together 
And on that occasion, that whole thing just satisfied everybody, and they, and they went to work together uh, to get the job done. But every work, every program within the Lord's Church must have an evangelistic purpose and goal. No matter what it is, Meals on Wheels, whatever it may be, Food for Friends, whatever the work is, whatever the program is, how can we use that program or that outreach in the community uh, to sow the seed, to point people uh, to Jesus, uh, to, to, to get them to come and obey the gospel, worship with us, wh whatever it may be. But we've got to have evangelistic fervor. And I think the, the last one that we're going to have time to, to do anything with is this letter G. We've got to have the attitude of I want to serve. An I want to serve attitude. I want to teach you a new word. You won't find it in your dictionaries. You won't find it anywhere hardly. It's a new word. The word is you got to want to. You got to want to. And I'll spell it for you. Y-A-G-O-T-T-A-W-A-N-N-A. -N -N -A. You got to want to. Miss Elaine, is that a word? Have you ever heard that word before? That ain't a word. That's a made-up word, but it's a good word. You got to want to. People do what they want to do. If you don't have the want to, you're not going to do it. And I know none of that is proper English and grammar, but it don't matter. It's okay. You understand what I'm trying to say. You got to want to. That's a powerful word. You see, it applies to every aspect of life. You got to want to. Business, whatever it is, you got to want to. Church, you got to want to. You got to want to serve God. You got to want to serve other people. The early church served and sacrificed and helped and, and did all that they did because they wanted to, bottom line. They wanted to and they were motivated uh, by uh, love. Galatians 5 verse 13 says, But by love serve one another. But by love serve one another. And when we do that, we're following the example of Jesus. In Matthew 20, verse 28, Scripture says, For the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. But you've got to have that want to. That want to. That I want to serve attitude. Or as Trippy McGuire says, put me in, coach. Put me in, coach. I don't want to just sit on the sidelines or in a pad, padded pew somewhere and watch everybody else do everything. I want to get in. I want to be a part of it. I want to uh, do some work. We're going to close with one line of this song. Give me the heart of a servant, tender and faithful and true. Fill me with love, then use me, O Lord, so that the world can see you. No doubt about it, that first century church, those early Christians, they faced some, some obstacles. They faced a lot of opposition and persecution. But in spite of all that, they grew. They grew. And there was a lot of reasons behind their growth. And we can put all of those in practice within the Lord's church here, even tonight, starting tonight. And we will grow. Because God will give us the increase. Whether it's numerically, spiritually, however you want to grow, we can follow their example and we too will, will grow against all odds. Will you bow with me as we pray? Father God, we love you. We thank you for tonight and the opportunity we have to come together to study your word, to be reminded of uh, your love and your power, the instructions that we find in your word to, to live, to pattern ourselves after so that we can be more like Jesus. Father, we pray that you'll help us uh, in our own lives to uh, desire to grow uh, personally in our walk with you to grow closer to you uh, to grow deeper in our knowledge and our understanding of your word uh, as, as, as your congregation father as your, your people to, to grow closer and closer to you uh, to grow spiritually to grow numerically uh, father to be more of what you'd have us to be uh, father we pray tonight that as we depart this place and go back out into uh, our mission field out into the world back out into uh, our everyday walk of life father we pray uh, that we'll take these truths these principles, uh, this lesson tonight, and take it with us, uh, live it out in our lives, uh, that people around us can see you living in us. We pray that you will forgive us, dear Father, for our sins. Help us every day uh, to grow in into the image of Christ, for it's through him we pray. Amen.